Welcome everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome, welcome to Facebook Live. Hope everyone had a wonderful 4th of July Independence Day holiday. It is the 5th of July today, year 2023. Um, I'm gonna welcome our panel. Hopefully the other members show up too. So let me get started. We have Rob here. Um, good evening, Rob. Rob is an author of a book called Stop Thinking, and I don't remember the rest of the title, but I do know the main part of the title is Stop Thinking. And Summer just joined us online. Grateful Summer, as always. And then we have Patricia, who's part of our core group of meditators. Good evening, Patricia. And I don't know where April and Kelly and Kelly and uh, Caesar are, but hopefully they join. So um, today I actually wanted to ask, I mean, I was going to ask the whole panel, I wish a April was here, but I'll bring up Patricia, what you brought up in group meditation, like a couple, three weeks ago. I, I don't know if it was during group meditation or I think it was through group meditation. Um, so Rob, the question kind of is, so she said something like, um, I don't know how, uh, why are Byron Katie and Marion Williamson suddenly so, uh, uh, they have a purpose and they know what they're doing. What is my purpose, R right? She's, she burst out with that um, kind of uh, thing. And I couldn't explore it because we, we get very late into the night. And like, I'm, I wake up at four in the morning, just like Patricia. So by Friday, I'm like exhausted. There are only a few questions that I can respond to. And I try to respond to as many as possible. But then I have it like filed away that, okay, this question was asked, that we can bring it up during Facebook Live or the next group meditation. So um, I, I would love for you to explore um, how is it that some people are so, uh, what does it take? What does it take to become a Byron Katie? What does it take to become a Marianne Williamson? Or what does it take to become an Eckhart Tolle? And why is it, then start with, why am I not um, someone who has a purpose? And how do I become, have a purpose? I'm sure when Patricia talks, she'll have more questions, but I'll let you get started with that. And I'll tag everyone uh, while you're speaking. Okay, thank you. I, 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 hope, it's an, I hope it's a good question, right? I, I love the question, so that's why I brought it up. Yes, it's uh, it's I it's a great question. I love it. It's right up my alley as far as the things that I ask about all the time. The first point that comes to mind when we want to know what our purpose is, is recognizing that our divine purpose is given to us by the one consciousness, by source. And we have this strange capacity to be able to say, no, I don't want that. Or no, I I'm I know you made me an oak tree, but I'd rather be a dandelion. And we do that, and that's what causes stress and struggle and strife. A lot of times our fears are the portal to the area of our dharma or divine expertise. I think the way to find out what our true purpose is, is by looking in those dark areas that are a bit fearful. And, and I don't mean the physical fearful areas like I'm afraid of heights, so I think I should go jump out of airplanes. That's not what I'm saying. The fear that we should go through is the fear of the fictitious monster under the child's bed. We, it's, it's just a fear in the back of the mind that says, I have a fear of public speaking, say. And it's, it's best to put myself in those situations to see if some kind of creative avenue opens up. I guess before that is started, the alignment of peace needs to be found to find our purpose. I, I studied the Bhagavad Gita and 
I'll butcher this because I interpret things in my own way and then I regurgitate them the way that I've interpreted them. And so I, I'm terrible at quotes and I'm terrible at explaining. So I'm going to put this in my point of view, which is once we find what the Bhagavad Gita calls the Atman within, which is our divine purpose, we find this center of peace. And once that's found, you it seems to be that suffering gets us there. The suffering is pointing us to look some other in some other category in our life. I thought my purpose was to do X, Y, and Z. I thought it was to be a lawyer or a truck driver. And I followed all the protocols. I followed what my parents taught me, the religions, the society, and followed all these rules. But I never listened to the inner peace. I never found the Atman within and started following this divine. It's not a voice that we hear. It's kind of a calling. It kind of nudges us to go left or right in life. Sometimes it nudges us to just be completely flatlined and still and vacationed out for a few days, if, if that's what it is. So we, we've moved through this suffering. We find this Atman within. And then it, the Bhagavad Gita is this, a story about, I think his name is Arjun, if I remember his name right. And he needed to follow his divine purpose, his, his dharma, his divine purpose didn't make sense. And the story is kind of a metaphor, and I'm using my own words, by the way, but the story is kind of a metaphor for this um, thing that goes on in the mind. Uh, Arjun was faced, his opposition was family members and loved ones, and he had to, had to possibly kill them in war. And really what that is saying no one no one is saying that we need to go kill people and kill our family members what, what that is saying are the things that are in our mind that are so near and dear to our heart that we absolutely love sometimes we have to slay that sometimes it's a belief that's a false belief and we have to kind of go to war in our own mind so to speak and and i use that word really broadly because there really is no war there's just a relinquishing of bogus layers of the false self but it depends on the perspective how, how we want to look at this so sometimes our dharma our spot dharma or whatever the term was uh you know our divine purpose in life is to actually go through some portals that don't make sense i think the, there's something in the in the bible about god never takes us on a straight path and i think that's kind of the the terminology it, it doesn't make sense i i thought i got this job in order to be promoted in order to get a family and in order to do this and it's never that way it, it's always no you got this job so that you could get fired or something there was something that had to get turned around inside eventually we find this divine purpose and it is married with peace inside D divine purpose we will still face some layers of fear it might be a little fearful at first to do a bunch of Zoom calls or public speaking as it is for me, but I know my divine purpose is to share my story. This is part of it, is taking off these layers of uh, egoic false self that, were, that used to steer me. And now I don't follow the, I, I take in the advice of the world, but I do, that's not the primary source. That's, that's not the leader, uh, the, the horse and buggy. The horse is the, the divine purpose. It's that inner knowing, that inner calling. That's the horse. The buggy is all the knowledge that I have. It's the, it's the worldly stuff. It says things like, you know, you, you shouldn't commit a crime. Uh, you should you know, you, you, you need to wear clothes when you're walking in public. There's these certain rules that, that we have to follow. And they're, they're always secondary. Um, if, we, if, we may, if we put the cart before the horse and we follow the rules of the world, we'll get it all messed up. And, you know, we see that time and time again. Rosa Parks stood up and said, you know what, I'm not going to stand, I'm not going to be on the back of the bus anymore. I just because of my skin color, I'm done with that. She broke a rule. And it was a worldly rule It was the cart before the horse. It wasn't the divine purpose. It, and she knew it. 
And she followed her inner calling to break a worldly rule and a social rule. And I think that's what we all are called to do, but not always in the physical world. We're called to do that in the vibrational and mental world. We're, we're here to break those layers that bog us down, that, that stir up fear. And we know that, at least I know I'm not on the right path if I'm not feeling peace. The, the moment anxiety rises up and my mind goes off and it says, you messed up at work or you did this wrong or you don't understand. Maybe it'll, maybe my mind will even tell me, I don't know what my purpose is. At that moment, if I feel lost, I lost my way. It's that uh, Eckhart Tolle says the ego comes in through the back door. The, the moment that happens to me, I know I lost my way. Peace is the way. And it doesn't matter if I tan physically, tangibly know to make a left or a right. It all starts with peace. And I find the center of peace and then nothing comes to me and nothing comes to me and nothing comes to me. And eventually a thought will come to me, a divine thought that says, make a left turn, make a right turn, or someone will come into my life that I never thought would ever come into my life and change up my, some, some surroundings for me. So put it in a quick context, our purpose, the, the reason we are, well, if we want to be a Eckhart Tolle or a Byron Katie or a spiritual person, that's fine. We can work to achieve that. If it's not our divine purpose, it will be a terrible struggle and it'll be stress and anxiety. Um, but if it is our divine purpose, it may take hard work. We might lose a little bit of sleep. It may take some physical effort but it will be the Wu Wei kind of effort. It will be the effortless doing. It will be the doing, not doing. It, it's like the painter creating. He's, he's painting on the wall and he's, and he's just in flow and he forgot to eat because he's so consumed in creativity. To the onlooker, it looks like he's working so hard and he's struggling, but he's got a big smile on his face. He's in his creative flow. And so sometimes we get those two things messed up. Uh, with 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 that but um i hope that covers it that's my best uh thoughts so what that. do you what do you think that i'm not at the byron katie you know when she said um i'm not where byron katie is why is why is byron katie byron katie and marion williamson marion williamson but i'm not there dating so many people so why do you think that that person is not there because it's it's a it's a um, it's a wrong way, and I use this word as uh, modestly as I can. It's a wrong way to look at things. We humans love to chop things up, dissect them, label them, categorize them, and uh, we are Byron Katie. We are Eckhart Tolle. We already are, but we are in our own right. We, we, are, we are the most perfect manifestation of God that we possibly can be, even with our flaws. There's oak trees out there that have big holes in the side of them and big growths on the tree, but they're beautiful. That, that's not what it's about. It's about finding that peace within. And that's, I, I think it's a flaw in thinking. Perfect. Thank you so much for your response, Rob. Grateful for it. Yeah. I love the pointer on that we have to bring our inner peace, like our Atman, uh, be in alignment. What Eckhart's words would be, would be always be in alignment with your inner being. As long as you're in alignment with your inner being, you're living your purpose. In a new earth, um, he has a um, person asking in one of the chapters seven or eight, he, he says, a person asks, uh, what is my purpose? Uh, is it going into the office? Um, uh, what is my purpose? And he says, your purpose is sitting right now in front of me and listening to me. That is your purpose. Right? We kind of think that there's this humongous mega thing that is our purpose. 
right? Like that we have uh, 19 million followers or we have 27 million followers, that's our purpose. But no, right now, if we are in presence, we have lived our purpose. I want everyone to know that one truth. And I think that's what you are meaning by saying, be at peace first, come from that space of peace. And this is what Eckhart says, is that you have to be in presence first. That's your purpose. If you're doing it moment to moment to moment and not losing yourself in reactivity, whether you're in traffic, whether you're in the office, whether you're in, no matter what, every second you are in presence, then you're living your purpose already, right? You're living out your dharma already. Yes, and if I could just jump in there and say that I agree and that that inner peace is actually what we, what, what the mind, if we, we, we want a goal, we're very goal oriented. We want to be somewhere. We want to protect ourselves. We want to make sure there's retirement in, in, in the bank account. And so I like to tra make that transition. And, and I, instead of the carrot dangling in front of me being a goal oriented uh, to be the, to, to make it to, a, to have so many followers or whatever it is, I've changed that to peace. Uh, the carrot in front of me now is peace and whatever and and the the most incredible thing has happened in my life and i i think it i, I think eckhart tolle talks about the universe wanting what it is that we want and when we put peace at the first part of what whatever it is that we're looking for then the universe now is opened up to provide to us what the universe knows needs to be married up with us in the manifestation world. It, the universe knows whether we're an oak tree or a dandelion, and sometimes we get that confused. So if we can switch the goal up a little bit, and instead, instead of saying, I want to be an Eckhart Tolle or a Byron Katie or a Poonam uh, or whatever it is, I want to, I, now it's peace. Peace is the only thing I want. And whatever the universe wants to give me, I will be at peace with. It's a it's the most beautiful path I've lived on, and I've been living on this path for a year and a half now. Beautiful, thank you, Ram. And then um, you brought up the for um, the retirement four one k, right? That I'm working towards the retirement four one k, which even Eckhart says, right? That uh, all you do in your life is you're working towards a four hundred one k. What what's the next vacation? When can I get old and I can go golfing? But is that your purpose? Right? I mean, what kind of a purpose is that? That you will have a retirement saving and and that you will go golfing? Is that really who you truly want to be? Is uh, Eckhart's, um, I think he's urging us to go find our alignment with inner beingness more than the 401k and Oh, I should have this. I mean, we think, right? Um, I think in the US, it's like very popular that white picket fence, uh, two kids, uh, two car garage, uh, a house, single family home. And then I, I need to have my job for 30, 40 years, have the retirement, and then I'm successful. That is success. But is that truly success? Right? Right. So, because we spent our life waiting. Mm hmm. Let me ask April. Uh, thank you, Ram. Thank you for your input. So grateful. So grateful. April, did you get the question? And actually, since you also are towards wanting to use express a few weeks back that you wanted to lead more and more people, now I'll let you explain this. Why am I not a Byron Katie? Or why am I not a Marion Williamson? What does it take to be a Byron Katie? Or what does it take to be a Marion Williamson? What is the goal and purpose in life if I'm not there? Thank you. So you guys already, you know, made the, I don't know if I want to say most important points that having inner peace is the goal. It's everybody's goal. Every person's 
ultimate goal, every soul's ultimate goal is having that inner peace and that connection with source. That is the goal. Um, the next part of that goal, and it kind of coincides with that goal, is unconditional love for everything. That is another part of it, to have unconditional love for yourself and everything else, um, removing the stories, the judgment. That's one thing that Eckhart is really good at, is teaching you how to remove the judgment, how to remove the stories in the head. Um, one of the things is, uh, so it is my goal to, and I am still working at that goal. And I know we're not supposed to say that, right? <laughs> not working at anything. <laughs> um, but that is my goal. And it is something that I am still working on um, to be able to reach more people at once versus my day job where I am working one-on-one -on -one with people. Um, it also goes with readings, you know, doing the psychic readings and the energy healing, that's one-on-one. -on -one. And my passion is to be able to teach many people at once. Usually when you have a passion, it is because it is something that is in your soul. It is a dharma. It is a calling. It is something that, you know, we desire and the universe desires for us. One of the things that I can say is that um, it takes time because there's so much to learn. There's so much to unpack. There's so much to learn to just learning to be in presence. It, it, it's a learning process. You know, first you have to realize all the patterns that you have had and all the shadow work we can call it right you have to realize all of that shadow work and you have to bring yourself to a state of presence that you can maintain and that's the hard part is in this world with all the distractions and all the things going on and whether you have kids or no kids and boss and husband and no husband and wife and is being able to maintain that energy maintain that presence power that connection and once you're able to really maintain it then to me you're ready to teach it to others so it's it's also a process um and then there's another part of this is uh i think eckhart is one of those people that he definitely had this in his uh dharma in his soul plan because it, it did take a while, but it did just kindly manifest for him. I mean, somebody has a spiritual awakening in one night and they never go back to that state. That's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. Most of us, it's a process. It's a journey of uh, dissolving the ego. It doesn't happen overnight like that for many of us. And then other people are... I say fortunate, but maybe I shouldn't say that word to have an NDE that shows them a whole nother side to life. Most of us don't get that. Right. And then we have other people that this angel pops up in their room right in front of them. Like, whoa, there really is another side. So for many of us, it, it is a process of learning. It's a process of developing your um, presence power, developing your energy. Uh, opening your energy to the other side, to the angels, to the guides, to source. And then we need to not forget that um, the other part of this is it takes connection. It takes connections. It takes knowledge of how to do Facebook and YouTube at the same time. It takes, you know, having a message that people uh, want to hear. So. The biggest thing is is hidden in that is your desire to help 
which is good. So I would try to seek out where you could help. Is it a yoga studio? Is it a meditation group in your city? Is it, you know, where can you help? And, and then just kind of go from there. You know, I did my stuff uh, for a long time. And then magically one day I found Poonam. So, uh, and actually your questions and your statements are, have grown exponentially. Like you have grown yourself from the beginning when you first came. And a lot of the things that you say are super insightful and you are helping people right now. You are being Byron Katie right now. You just don't realize it. Um, so I would start small and see what you can do. And then you also need to figure out most people have a theme. So my theme is always self-esteem and self-love and self-worth. That's my passion. Um, and connecting you to that inner peace. So you would figure out what's your passion too. You know, what is your one thing that you seem to always want to show people or teach people or you wish that people knew? A lot of times it's your key thing too. Like for me, when I was able to realize that I am part of source and because of that alone, I have infinite worth. It's the same concept of Jesus saying, ye all are gods. Well, I took that wholeheartedly after <laughs> finally at one point in my life. And that was it for me. Once I realized I had that infinite worth. So you also want to find your deep inner message so that you can help people. But it's, it's totally a process. So, um, like, um, the question is also, why am I not Byron Katie today? Or why am I not, uh, why is April not a Marion Williamson today? So if you want to elaborate on that, what did it take Byron Katie? And I'll, I'll give a background on both Byron Katie and Marion Williamson after you're done, April. Thank you. Well, um, I think that's different for everybody. Um, and again, a lot of it too is um, connections and part of it, like Eckhart, he had a message. It was very clear. It was a message the world needed to hear. I do think that it was like divine intervention with him. Um, why am I not them today? For me, it, there's a bunch of different factors that are involved. Um, just huge, just a lot of different factors. You guys know I have like 100 children and that plays a factor. <laughs> I don't have 100, but, um, you know, for as far as like being able to travel the world and things like that, it wasn't time. I'm just now approaching that time where I'll be able to do that. I also did have my day job because I did need to, you know, maintain a home and pay bills and things like that. And that's how this matrix is, is set up currently at, at this time. Um, so I think it all takes time. And then also there's that whole part of in here is, um, like I said, the imposter syndrome of why am I not good enough to be Byron Katie or Marianne Williamson right now? Um, there, that's a whole ego process you have to go through that my message is good enough and strong enough, um, to heal the world. So I think really it's a lot of factors as to why it's not like, why am I not here today? I've asked that question myself at times, like what the heck is taking so long? But I just realized that um, in time, you know, kind of like Rob said, in time it, it manifests itself. You see, and you, you come to know. Um, and then you, the more you push it, the more frustrating it seems. But when you kind of step back and you let the world lead me, I didn't always have this, this vision. It actually just came to me one day. It just came to me and it, I literally heard, you're supposed to be doing more. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> so that I just heard it. It's like divine, you know, guidance too. 
Both of you are incredibly amazing. Thank you, Rob, and thank you, April. So grateful for all the responses. Um, to, so to fill in Patricia, I don't know if you know, Patricia, that Marion Williamson was al actually an alcoholic. Debbie Ford was an alcoholic. Uh, Byron Katie was uh, agoraphobic and um, she was kind of alcoholic, um, addicted to. Um, they also had the similar experience as just what Eckhart had. And if you see um, somewhere Eckhart says in A New Earth or The Power of Now, that many people that are highly spiritual right now, they actually, their pain body brought them to a spiritual awakening. And he's actually thinking of the Marion Williamson's of the world, the Debbie Ford's of the world, and the Byron Katie's of the world, that they were suffering so much. The suffering brought them to the same point as Eckhart. They were suicidal. Um, but Byron Katie was in a halfway house. Uh, she was, she had to, like, April is talking about self, she had such low self-esteem that she wouldn't even sleep on the bed in a halfway house. She was sleeping on the floor and a cockroach walked over her um, foot. She opened her eyes and that moment she had that awakening that before the cockroach, she had no thought. The moment the thought arose, the suffering began. And that's her teaching. Right? She caught that moment of silence. And she realized that without thought, no suffering. Then the moment the thought arose, here's the suffering. And she started in, Byron Katie supposedly started in her home. She would ask, people would call her. Like when she started uh, teaching people the work, people would call her, come, uh, and she would ask them to come stay. Like, Inviting strangers, come two or three people, stay in my home, and I'll show you how to do the work. Buying Katie was not like whatever, 20,000, 80,000, 100,000, 300,000 people. The moment she got awakening, Eckhart had an awakening at 28, 30,000 people were not uh, following him, right? Or millions of people were not following him. Eckhart took 30 years from 28 till almost 47, 48 before he wrote The Power of Now, before he had this success. So we are, we are looking at Eckhart and thinking that, oh, he was uh, so successful, or we're looking at Byron Katie and saying, oh, she was so successful. Her children hated her. Byron Katie said her sons wouldn't even talk to her, right? Because they saw the mother who was so hateful, like she was a like horrible mother. And she, after her awakening, she says, yes, I can see that mother in me. Because she knew herself, right? What she was before. So same thing with Marion Williamson. I think her alcohol, like Debbie Ford, she said she was crawling on a bathroom floor, like alcohol, like such deep uh, addiction to alcohol. She was literally crawling on the bathroom floor and something happened, snapped. She had the awakening and she started doing the shadow work and she did like amazingly well. So it takes, like either you have that immediate spiritual awakening and then success comes, but I don't think success comes to even them immediately. Eckhart had to do the one person, he would sit in living rooms and two or three people come talk to him. Just like we are doing group meditation, right? Like five or six people are coming or 10 people come, we are talking. Now, we don't know where all this is going to go, but for right now, this is what it is. The five or 10 people come together and we are serving those five or 10 people. And I agree with April. I mean, the amount of questions you ask and the um, incredible curiosity that your spirit has, it gives us a platform to actually, you are not realizing how much you're serving this Facebook Live Q&A panel because since last year, We've had more and more churn of questions just because of you. I mean, I don't come up with questions. Like 50% of the time, I think we are talking about what Patricia is asking, right? So with that, I'll let you ask and then maybe we'll have responses for you. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. 
that's that's my point though i feel that i'm taking that i am always in that receptive mode but never giving and i know receiving is giving and giving is receiving but i guess that's my uh like april says that's my ego thinking that i'm not good enough and um i just don't know how to get rid of it in a sense that um sometimes that presence i do experience moments of it and it's very peaceful like uh, rob says so i don't know you know how to if i'm on the right path to it's almost like april i, I want to be there already it's it's you know the time spiritual people all those gurus they say you don't need time right you don't need time but then on this level of earthy stuff it's manifestations so i just with doing meditations of uh, dr joe and thinking about the future you want to just visualize yourself certain things and then i almost doubt myself if this is it's like how do i know if the vision that it's coming to me it's not ego that i want certain things and then it's like yeah it's okay you just have to vibrate at the light and all of a sudden you'll you'll get all you want because the universe wants to give you everything you want but i don't really know it there's uh, limiting beliefs but i almost like i'm scared to want certain things because i don't know if i'm going to get it <laughs> and if if it's not like selfish or things to want things right and if it's the right thing how do i know let's say let's have an example i don't want to be alone right and then everything everybody leaves me there's a period of my life that you know i didn't really have people around me because maybe i was just not pleasant to be around and um so now i'm accepting my aloneness and when i do the meditations i want to visualize you know silly things like maybe going on vacation with someone just just to enjoy because i see around there's one of the possibilities people do that people enjoy you know having partners in life families and going on vacation and um silly things like that so wanting earthy things is it still part of being spiritual or once you're spiritual you really don't need anything and you're just sitting and you're just completely happy with whatever but how can you still be active with others you know i'm not going to go somewhere to himalayas in the monastery and be just alone because i love people i love like every wednesday when i get to meet with you i love it meditations i love it and it's not because um discipline i have to be there blah 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 it's just like i actually have a pure enjoyment in in spending this time with you and even at work i enjoy you know being with people so and i'm coming home to that empty apartment every night as abraham hicks says you cannot be focused on what is this is this this <laughs> you cannot focus on what is because that is not your manifestation then then you're on the wrong end of the stick as uh, you're focusing on what is not 
oh, this uh, relationship or these friends are not there in my life. These friends are not there in my life. These friends are not there in my life. I don't have people in my life. What are you focusing on? No, no, I'm, what, I'm not. What are you, what are you focusing on? What are you focused? That that is your inner energy right now. What what you just said? I I don't have friends. I don't have a partner to go with on vacation. I don't have someone to go on vacation. But you're focusing on what is not. Instead of saying I have I have a, a daughter who visits me. I have this Facebook Live um, that I have so many. Where do you focus? You focus, I love being on the Facebook Live. I have so many friends there. I love going to group meditation. I have so many friends there. Um, I love that Poonam has a Sunday meditation where I have uh, friends there. I can join Eileen's group meditation. I'll have friends there. I can go to the pool and I'll, ha I'll see people there. Instead of focusing on that, you're focusing on this. Which end of the stick are you focusing on? And what is manifesting? So, what we, uh, where attention goes, energy flows. Remember that um, Tony Robbins says that, Dr. Joe says that. So, where attention goes, energy flows. Your attention is on the wrong side of the stick. So, I still do not have enough presence power to be accept no. what, what, what is. What you have to do is the body, you're used to these 20, 30 years, you've been training your body saying, I told you, right, culturally, you feel that you need the damsel in distress, that you need a knight in, prince in knight, knight in shining armor, right? That archetype is there in you. So work with that archetype and say, I know, I understand my body. I've, I've trained my body to have that emotion. Now I just need to change it. When you change it to joy, right? The joy of meeting us on Facebook Live Q&A, meeting us. I mean, I I don't even, I have not even driven my car in two weeks, I think. I haven't gone out. All I've seen is y'all and the group meditation. And I see my son, but he, even him, I may not see him for more than 10 minutes because he goes, do, goes and does his thing, right? So it, it's like one person in two weeks. But I see my work people and I see all of you and that's it. And virtually, not, not even physically seeing a person. But that is what it is, right? And I, I feel joyful. I love the, being at the Facebook Live. I love being at the group meditation. So it manifests more for me, right? People come, I, I see people. I let April answer and I let Rob answer. Go ahead, April. Thank you. You said a whole lot there. <laughs> oh. Wanting is not bad. I do not agree with that. I've heard teachers say that. It's not bad to want things. Wanting is actually part of the process. Because if you don't have any desires, what are you working towards? What are you moving towards? How do you have passion? It's not bad. Uh, like it's, I don't agree with that, that it's bad. <clears throat> it's the attachment to the desire that we don't want. We don't want to be attached to the desire, whether it happens or doesn't happen or how fast it happens or how big it happens. When, you know, all of that, that's where the issue comes in. You have a desire. You put the desire out into the universe. You let the universe handle the way that it needs to come. There's a divine timing. Divine timing is why I'm not talking to hundreds of people at the same time right now. It's not time yet. I'm okay with that. I'm also okay with holding that passion and saying, okay, when it's time, I'm ready. I'm right here. I'm ready. And then things unfold. You know, maybe I have to work on something or maybe some part of my pattern or my shadow pops up and I have to work on that. Maybe I have to learn to maintain my energy better. Um, those kinds of things. Not that I think there's something wrong with me, but this is a process. This is a journey. We are a soul evolving. 
you are evolving, you are forever growing. Why? Because that is what the universe does. That's what source does. That's what we're doing. We are evolving back into source. That's a process over many, many lifetimes, right? So don't think that your desires are bad because they're not. You need to remove the attachment to the desire and the looking for, okay, is it happening today? All right, look, it's been two weeks. Right. So there's a story that um, I heard Wayne Dyer say one time. And this little boy has this puppy, you know, one of those annoying little kid toys that are the puppies on the string, a little plastic puppy. And you pull it and it goes click, 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 right? It's one of those annoying little toys. I always, you know, that's like that other popcorn toy that people give kids. I'm like, you best not ever have a child because that is coming back. Seriously. So this little boy has this toy and the leg on the toy breaks. So the boy asks God, do you know, to fix the toy. God says, yes, you ask, I give it to you. A few weeks go by, little boy looks up and he's like, hey, my dog's still broke. And God said, yes, it is. I will fix it. And then some more time goes by and the boy is like, you know what? I asked you and I asked you, you told me you were going to do it and you haven't done it. Why have you not fixed my toy? And God says, because you never let go of the string. Never fully let the problem go you never fully let god the universe actually handle it for you you are still micromanaging or trying to hang on parts of it or do parts of it yourself that doesn't mean you don't put action part of the manifestation law of attraction that was hugely missed was that you need to put action behind you know your desires you don't just sit on the couch and watch potato chips and money falls out of the sky that's not how that happens but that's part of the letting go and letting the universe answer for you. So you remove expectation, you remove the attachment to the desire, and you allow the universe to lead you. So what do you think about that one? <laughs> Incredible, April. Thank you so much. I think it's uh, more like uh, what Eckhart said, right? Like uh, when he was in London, he was not reaching to many people. He was just doing like visits, people visiting in the house or a small gathering of one person or 10 people or 20, 30 people. And then he went to this church and he said, um, I'm ready. Uh, what does he uh, accelerate, please? accelerate what I have and in that moment he had this whole desire to leave London and move to North America and the moment he moved to North America whatever teachings he had been teaching for 20-30 years he started putting it in the power of now as a book and look what happened then the book came across Oprah Oprah had a this thing uh radio show with him and then uh, when he wrote a new earth she had a webcast the webcast exploded so something of that when we are aligned and that's what rob is saying that's what april once we are aligned right once that alignment comes with what consciousness wants to do through us that's a perfect example of eckhart suddenly i mean he was not successful for 30 years his uh father passed away without him being successful ever R right his father never knew the successful Eckhart and he always says thankfully my mother was still alive when I became her her son became successful and all his until 47 48 years old uh, she would always say you are so useless why did you leave the PhD program at Cambridge why did you leave the I'm paraphrasing you're so you, you, you did not make anything of yourself you know what parents think that if he would have done a PhD program at Cambridge not realizing no his path is to be a world leader spiritual uh, thought leader right 
Dale keeps talking about the what isness that he left the Cambridge program and look at, at all these successful people that did PhDs at Cambridge and he couldn't even finish that. So I um, also also read a story that when you were talking about it, you and April, um, that sometimes we want something, right? We want something and want something and ask God and then you're not getting and you reach the point that you are okay with not getting it and then i i reach i mean you're okay either way and um in anthony de Mello's book that i still have an actually polish version of it i brought it here to us i started to reading it again and at one of the his short little stories are exactly about that that someone was asking God for some for some riches, riches, and he wasn't giving it. And and finally, at the end of his life, he got it. And the, the guy says, yeah, now it's too late. I don't need it anymore. And the gods ask him, like, so what do you think was better, getting what you want or actually being in, at peace either way? So he, the guy understood, it's like, wow. I'd rather had that peace because then the wanting disappears really. So I was really thinking about it a lot. And, um, but again, it's not so much it, as uh, getting rid of, getting rid of the wanting, um, as April said, Patricia, you have to realize that because we are on this earth. Um, consciousness wants to, pleasure itself through us, right? Consciousness wants to, but I'm not talking about the pleasure of like you're eating a pile of food and getting pleasure. I'm talking about the joy of, um, uh, the correct word would be the joy of selflessly giving because in the giving, we are expressing unconditional love. And um, when we are selflessly giving, right? Um, we are, um, being one with the divine we are unconditionally allowing that energy to move through us right when we are in, just like a dancer why is michael jackson michael jackson was so horrible as a human being but look at the moment he got on stage and that energy moved through him i mean he attracted millions people would go crazy Right. But look at his personal life, how demented his personal life was. But look at what. So that's the alignment. The desire needs to arise in alignment with consciousness. The desire cannot be an egoic desire, like the wanting that uh, we are asking not to have is the egoic wanting. Oh, I, I want a big cheesecake. Oh, I want a big uh, 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 whatever decadent meal, or steak and potatoes and whatnot, what, whatever people here in the, uh, here in uh, Texas, it's always barbecue. Everybody wants huge thing. They'll sit with a huge platter of barbecue and all kinds of meats, big ribs. they would be like this big ribs and they'll just sit with a pile of food, right? That's what Texas is about. Everybody loves Texas barbecue. So um, that's, uh, more being stuck in energy center one and the earthly thing uh, dragging us, right? Pull up the earthly. That kind of wanting will not work because that's still energy center one. We want to start at energy center. What's the desire? What April is talking about, the desire that comes from being in that heart center and what is the heart wanting? What is the unconditional love? How How can I express my unconditional love. So your question should be, uh, I would love to go travel with somebody. Um, can I ask Poonam? Poonam, do you wanna come travel with me? I wanna go to this country. Uh, can I ask April? April, do you wanna come with me? I want to go. Why does it have to be a partner in your head? Why didn't you ask Poonam? Why didn't you ask April? You don't know. Why didn't you ask Summer loves to travel. 
summer loves going out with people and doing things out and going to the Bahamas, going to uh, Hawaii. She loves traveling. Why didn't you ask summer? Some of her, hey, I want to go to Egypt summer. You want to come with me? Ask Summer. Summer would love to travel with you, right? Why does it have to be? So because you're stuck on the specifics, right? I'm stuck on specifics. And maybe some somewhere I, I listened to someone that was saying that to manifest, you got to be specific because if no. you don't, it's almost like self, you know, like uh, what you wish for. Uh, be careful what you wish for. You should never be stuck on the specifics, according to Dr. Joe, never define because you'd be, so when I uh, wanted a home, I just put a picture of a contemporary home in my uh, mind movie, right? When I watched the mind movie, I would watch a contemporary home, but there was no image of, yeah, uh, I would look at Anthony Williams's uh, backsplash and uh, cabinets and go, I love the white, backsplash and I love the white cabinets and those knobs right my home exactly has the same backsplash uh, other than I have it in a herringbone pattern I, I don't have it like he has a straight pattern of those white tiles I have a herringbone pattern right my home has the same pattern as so your desire is that's an alignment right consciousness wants to now provide me with a home because I put it in my mind movie, but it's not exactly the home or the picture of what I put in the mind movie. I would just say I, I want to be in a home uh, that apartment is so constricted. I'm not able to do the Facebook live freely. I want a room where I can uh, do meditation. Dr. Joe says, um, don't do your meditation in your bed. Get out of bed, get out of bed, find a space where you do your meditation. If you want to do your lying down portion, do it on the floor. Don't be in your bed because you fall asleep, right? And in the apartment, I had nothing, nowhere else to go but on the bed, right? right? There's no space. And here I have my own room where I do my meditation. I, I do the Facebook Live this room that I'm in. I do my Facebook Live freely. The door is closed and I'm alone by myself. There's no interruptions. I don't have to tell my son, if you ever come in, be very quiet. Don't get into the kitchen for the next three hours. And on Friday, we go for five, six hours. So for the six hours, don't, don't come into the kitchen. Don't disturb us. I mean, so many laws, right? Right. The last question I have for everybody. So it comes to the really the original question, why aren't we all like Mary and William Summer? Is it because do you think that none of us had that dramatic suffering mm -hmm. that it's either to die or to just change something? Mm -hmm. I mean, I had some pretty dramatic things, but maybe they weren't at that level that exactly. would push me to. Where they got alignment with the inner beingness, they, they were like so aligned in that moment. April, April, uh, you know, went through some pretty tough times. So you think that we're not close to what Eckhart was going through and he was just like... Because he was suicidal. He was like on the brink of suicide. Eckhart was... And then it's like the path too, right? Like some of us have to take the path of, like April said, like the slow progression. We are taking the slow progression. I, I think we are doing pretty good. If in 10, 15 years, we are where you are. You're like in a year, you like quantum leaps in where you were one year back to now with all, everyone's guidance. So let me ask Rob. Rob, do you want to answer some of these questions? I know you took some notes. Thank you. Yes, I do. I take notes uh, because I want to make sure I don't forget anything. Yes, so the first thing that comes to mind off of my notepad that you saw me writing down is the Tao Te Ching says the mind is unwell. And the first time I figured this, that I started uh, messing around with my own thoughts and, and deciding that my thoughts possibly were the cause of my physical problems in my life were, I looked at I looked at two things. One was alcohol. Why is it that when I drink alcohol, my problems go away? They're 
they mentally go away. They're still there in the world. And then I went on vacation and I realized I'm not drinking alcohol, but I'm on vacation and my mind is not making a problem of this situation right now. And the situation was never resolved. So then I started reading the Tao Te Ching and realized that the mind is unwell. So then I realized my mind is just habitually, it's conditioned and it's habitually bringing up these thoughts. And one reason possibly that this is a pleasant environment for Patricia is because your mind is in, is actively engaged at this moment. You are, I don't like the word control, but uh, I'll use it just because I'm not sure of a better word, but you're, you're kind of shifting your mind for a moment. The onus is on you to participate, to listen. You're enjoying this environment, but really you, what, what you're doing is that, that negative part of the brain, the conditioned patterns are not rising to the top right now because you're focused, you're engaged, you're conscious and aware of what, of this conversation and when we go off on our own, sometimes the mind just rises by itself. And then we have these mental triggers. We walk into the door and it says, it's just me here. I'm not meeting anyone for dinner. I'm not, uh, there, there's, I'm not gonna have my spouse next to me. And so now our environment is triggering and now thoughts arise and now emotions follow those. And something that I did was, Near the end of my 21 year trucking career, I held the steering wheel to a truck for 21 years. And that was a lot of mental conditioning. I allowed my mind to do whatever it wanted. In the last couple of years, I started programming my mind. I listened to uh, Joe Dispenza and, and a few others. And I recognized that my mind was off on its own and I was not controlling it. And I Again, I'm, I'm not big on that word control, but I'm not really sure what other word to use. So I intentionally played audio books while I drove that were uh, spiritual in some nature, positive in some nature, turned off all the news. Uh, I didn't actually buy a TV for six years. Um, I, I just bought a TV a short time ago. The, the idea is that the mind is sick and these moments that we have when we feel despair, uncomfortable, anxiety, insomnia. We feel lonely, uh, even desire. D desire is, is assuming that we're not God. God, is, God doesn't des des desire. He already has it all. We already, we are God in disguise. We already have it all. We have the vibrational equivalent of absolutely everything that God ever has. We have within us. And I noticed that when I started reprogramming my mind. So for eight hours a day, I was listening to these things and I'd come home and I thought, this is incredible. I feel, my, my body feels better. My digestive tract is working better. I started changing some foods and some other things, but I, I don't want to get too sidetracked. I, I want to stay on point with the fact that the mind is unwell. We do have a chance to train it. And we do have a chance to allow it to do whatever it wants. And I personally feel like that's the difference between heaven and hell in the mind. When I decide to let my mind be driven by the ego and its fears and its desires and the things that it wants, it can be short-lived fun to live through the egoic desires. So yeah, I'm partying. But truly the, the place that is completely fulfilling is to, is to have that awareness that you are everything at this moment. And it's terribly difficult to have that moment when once you're over, overtaken by that unconsciousness, by the, that negative energy when you walk into the door and that loneliness is overpowering. So... What I was doing in my own life with insomnia, suicidal depression, uh, spinal injury, back pain, uh, I couldn't walk for more than or sit for more than about 10 minutes for about six months. Uh, by the way, I, the second spinal injury, I healed metaphysically without any surgery, doing some of these mental techniques that I am talking about. And I truly, 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 truly believe that 
when we decide to own our mind and say, you know what, I, I know my mind is, is sending me signals here to feel bad. And my armpits are, I had um, chronic severe anxiety for 35 plus years. And so I would, what I call sit with myself and I'd say, okay, and you could do this when you walk into the, to the house and you feel this lonely presence, it's just you. You can sit with yourself like I did um, in the middle of the night or with panic attacks. And I said, yes, I know my armpits are sweaty. I know my palms are sweaty. I know my body is going through a habitual response and it doesn't know any better. It's all on its own. And it's telling me that I am lonely right now. I'm walking into the house and the house is signaling and all these things are going off and it's saying, you're lonely, feel lonely and the emotions rise. And at that moment, we have the choice to say, yes, my body is telling me something, but I know different. I'm conscious awareness now, and I can sit with this, and I can allow this to go through. Fine, yes, I'm here with myself. The body's reacting. I feel lonely. Yes, I do. I feel lonely, but I know I'm not. I know I can find that place of peace. And then just before you enter the house, just before I entered the bedroom to, to stay awake all night in my insomniac moments, I would try to get as present minded as I possibly could and say, I feel peace and I'd breathe and I'd listen to the tinnitus in my ears. It became like this helpful thing. I wanted to really dial into my mind and body and I wanted to only pay attention to that peaceful moment. And Eckhart Tolle and the others talk about this. You go into that moment and sometimes you're overtaken by you know, there, there were times that I would be overtaken walking into the bedroom and bam, I know I wasn't going to sleep well. And I, I, it was, I was gone unconscious. And then there's other times that I could make it into there and I'd lay in bed and I'd say yes. And then, and then it would rise up in me. So you'll take the conscious awareness into the room and you'll practice that presence power. And then you'll be overtaken and eventually putting the onus on yourself the mental side, the vibrational side to make that shift is how the, that, that desire will go away because the, be, uh, what is it? Um, to be caught in desire is to only know the manifestations and to be free from desire is to know the, the magic or something like that. And I'm putting it, this stuff in my own words, but I recognize that desire, like Poonam was talking about, picking up the wrong end of the stick. I think that's an Abraham Hicks thing. Uh, we, if, we, if, if I'm desiring for something, I'm on the wrong end of the stick. I'm saying I don't have it. And April, I totally agree with you. We have desires and, and we fulfillments and contentment and these are driving forces that help us to go through life. And I totally agree. They are appropriate and they're, they're definitely there, but it depends on the inner vibration and what we're aligned with at that moment. And so if our inner vibration is very low and we're suffering and feeling lack and insufficient, the desire is not helpful. The, the, we've picked up the wrong end of the stick. But if we're fulfilled, I'm fulfilled at, at this moment. And I have a desire for more things in my life. I have a desire to have a better relationship with both of my children and maybe a better relationship um, with an, a partner in life. Those are there. But like Eckhart Tolle talks about, you know, we, we want to come from the place of already being fulfilled and everything else is just ice cream on the cake. So the way to make the mental shift, and I'll finish this up really quick because I know it's getting late, is for me is to recognize that the mind is unwell, to recognize that I am I have the power to make that change, but I'm going to have to do the mental work and I'm going to have to recognize that the body's not going to want to come along with that mental work. The body's going to want to continue to have panic attacks while I was walking down the boardwalk in Ocean City, Maryland. My, my body was still freaking out, even though I was separated from it. I said, I'm not having this anymore. I'm staying at peace. And so continue, 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 continue. And one practice that I do now uh, still to this day is to take an absolute entire day of gratitude. And this is going to, I'm going to sound like a crazy person, uh, but when you come from chronic severe anxiety and insomnia and all of these mental illnesses that I had and spinal stuff, 
I had to do a lot of mental work. And one of them was every single thing that I did during the day, I said, thank you for it. And it would start opening my eyes and I in the morning and I'd say, thank you that my eyes can open. And I was just consuming my, I was, I was just inundating my mind. I was saying my mind, you are not going to control me anymore. I'm taking control. And I did it through gratitude. I walked to the bathroom and I said, thank you that I have a bathroom that's inside. Thank you that I have food. And I did not let that go. My phone would ring and I'd say, thank you that the phone would ring. And I did that all day. And it made no difference during the day. It was like watching the grass grow. You can't see it grow. But doing that over time, 30 days or so of that, and I didn't do a 30 days straight. I had to pick and choose those, those days, was phenomenal. It helped me 100%. So the mind is the place to start, not in the physical world. Allow the physical world to just show up and, and come to you in the form that it wants to come to you and be the vibrational equivalent of what you would like to have in the world beautiful thank you Ram. incredible thank you for your so grateful for all your personal experiences that you share they're very very effective um one of the things that um i would touch upon is uh, you know uh, one of the questions could come up why do I'll go back to Rob's 401k? Why do I not have a 401k and why do I not have the big, huge savings? Now, just imagine if Eckhart was given a 401k with big, huge savings, or Marion Williamson was given a 401k with big, huge savings. Would we have a thought leader right now? They had to go through their suffering, as uh, Dean Graziosi shows, right? You're going through the valley right now, Patricia, and you're actually rising up in the valley, right? So to build the bridge, you see his uh, valley and then that we have bridge builders, right? To build the bridge, you're rising up in the valley. So the moment you get to, just imagine that you're rising up, the moment you get to the other side, you're gonna know what that bridge is. So you're in that phase of rising up and knowing what the other side is so that you can build bridges. And that's when you'll be aligned with consciousness and you'll become that bridge builder. With that, I'll go to April so that April can wrap it up. I know it's getting late for everyone. Go ahead, April, if you want to answer her question. Thank you. Um, I don't know. Do you have any more of a question, Patricia? <laughs> the last part uh, what did you ask in the last uh, Patricia something about you know desires of wanting something and then uh, actually questioning if my wanting is part of the divine or is just part of the ego and how do I know the difference and then if I don't get something in a specific way Mm. will I be just happy by you know whatever happens and uh, or that wanting to actually accomplish something with a specific way I don't know makes sense yeah. I think I'm still with this visualizing specific things and then being okay with however it brings and then I understand getting myself to the high vibrations, but do I imagine something specific when I get to those higher vibrations or just imagine the feeling and then wait for the universe to bring me whatever it wants to bring me? And how do I recognize it? Just a little. Well, actually, they tell you to be more specific. So. Um, they say to actually visualize what you want, what it looks like. Now you can be vague, but really they tell you to be more specific. And when you're visualizing, you get into the high vibration. If you're looking to be fulfilled, if you are not okay, you are not fulfilled, then it is ego. If you are okay with where you're at, who you are, if you can 
gain that peace, that connection with source, then the desire that you have, it should be part of your purpose. It should be part of your soul, part of your calling. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to be, you know, Eckhart Tolle, because that can manifest in many, many ways. So that's also part of not being attached to it. If I'm in peace and I'm okay with source and I'm okay with divine timing, then I'm not attached to the outcome. And I do allow the universe to manifest in the best way for me and everybody else. Okay. So as far as specifics, yes, you are supposed to look at specifics. You're not attached to specifics again. But you want to visualize it, you want to see it, you want to try to maybe smell it, taste it, touch it in the visualization. You want to bring in all the senses. So if I want to achieve something in a vision, I will say I'm in a room. I'm in a room. I'm imagining the lighting. I'm imagining the energy in the room. I will perhaps touch a chair in the visualization. I will perhaps uh, touch my arm or give myself a hug or you want to bring in as many of the senses that you can in the visualization. But the, key, the absolute key is you have to be with source and you the ego has to be out of it. You have to be in the space of connection, of love, of allowance, and not attachment. Okay, that is, that's really important. I do have this desire. It is propelling me forward. It is making me grow as a person, as a spiritual thought leader, as those kinds. Of, but I'm not attached to whether it happens or it doesn't happen. So doing podcasts with Kelly and Kelly is part of it? Mm -hmm. Trying to be out there more? Mm -hmm. uh, that's part of it just because, I don't know, we came up with an idea. <laughs> but that is part of it. Um, but it's also it. like I listened. I listened, yeah. So it's really this good. This is part of it. Um, that's part of it. You know, there's many but I'm not attached to the outcome of it, right? And I don't think, oh, well, it must not be because it's just not happening. So it must, you know what? I should just give up and I should just quit. I think we all have those spaces because we're human where we're like, hey, what's happening, right? But like Rob was saying, it's important to notice when you go into those spaces which is part of the work. That's part of the pattern coming back up, the ego coming back up, the shadow, the childhood, all of it, all of that coming back up. You notice I have fallen back into this space. Oh, I've fallen back into this space. I need to correct my energy. I need to correct my thoughts. Where am I at? Again, if we're having less than thoughts, it's just because you are off center. You're so when people off. come to you, like, I can't, I don't think I can hear that inner voice. So maybe that's why I'm not clear because I didn't reach the point that I can hear it very clearly. So I know that the, it doesn't have to be your inner voice, Patricia, because um, if honestly, if I tell you, right, um, when I bought this home, I did not realize so they're different, you know, once you get into presence, right? Like when you do your meditations, when you did your four and a half, five hours of meditation, then after the meditation, when you set uh, uh, an emotion arises, right? Towards, a, and this is what uh, Dr. Joe calls an elevated emotion. So I used to do walking, med if you all remember, I used to do walking meditation, on the fourth floor of my garage, right? And the fourth floor of the way the building of the apartment was set up was um, 
uh, like my apartment one was in darkness because it was it, like one of those uh, uh, up, uh, uptown apartments that had an attached garage. So we were attached to the garage. So it was in darkness. So I would go, just go, why can't I be somewhere with the sunlight, right? What joy is it to feel sunlight as, as you are in your living room or in your bedroom, right? And then when I would look at my patio, if y'all ever see any of the videos where the patio is, there's a wall, right? So I would see walls. So I was like, why can't I be somewhere where it's open, like open space, right? And I would feel the joy of having an open space. But it's not like I sat down one day and for two hours I thought about these. These are like pockets of things that I would just send out that elevated emotion, right? And then I was doing the walking meditation. I don't know how many times I must have had the thought, why can't I ever see the east side of the sunrise? I always see the sunset. I mean, for 20, from 20, uh, 2016 till 2023, I was in that apartment all these six, seven years. I would always see the sunset, never the sunrise, right? Because that had the building, so it would like block my east view. There was building and buildings, and I would never see the east side. And then um, simple thing, when I would put my hairdryer in the drawer, the drawer was not deep enough. And the hairdryer, you know how it gets stuck in the drawer and you're, you're trying to jiggle it and trying to get, and I would go, why can't I just put my hairdryer and it not jiggle? Now, when I come to this house, when I open my, the blinds on my uh, bedroom, master bedroom, it's facing the east side. So I always see the sunrise whether I'm in my living room or in my bedroom, right? And then this Anthony William thing, right? Whenever I would look at his back, a backsplash and um, his cabinets, I would go, I love the white backsplash and the white cabinets. I, I love it, right? But it was just an elevated emotion. There was no, oh, want, it, there's no egoic wanting in it. Do you realize that? There's no, I want that backsplash, the white backsplash. There's no egoic, it's just, the desire to, um, the joyfulness is of consciousness, loving it. Like I said, right, we have to get aligned with what joy, how, what is consciousness flowing through me? How is it going to experience that unconditional love? How is it going to experience that joy? Now you may look at a white counter, counter backsplash and a white cabinet and go, ew, that's white. It's going to get dirty. It's so much work, right? But consciousness that flows through me looks at the same thing and finds joy. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what it is all about. I, I got like a cabinet that where I can put my hair dryer. It's a, it's a sliver of a cabinet. They gave a door to it, and all you do is open and put this hair dryer in there. And then the same thing. Oh, the other thing is my bathroom. I would always go, why am I in darkness? You know how apartment bathrooms are in, there's no window. It's like in a corner somewhere. And there was no light. I was like, why don't I have light? And now this bathroom has like uh, those uh, privacy windows that are frosted glass. So this frosted glass over like a vanity and over my shower. So there's so much sunlight because it's east facing, right? That side of the, this thing is east facing. The sun rises. And when I go to shower in the morning, like the sunlight is beaming down. Like the bathroom is so lighted up, right? With natural light. I don't even have to turn on most days with the Texas sun. I don't even have to turn on the lights if I don't want to, but I do when I'm showering. That it's like simple things. It is. You, have meantime, to re you did a lot of work, and you did also a lot of selfless giving to uh, healing, and you went yes to Dr. Joe's advanced retreat and everything. So it wasn't just you know you thinking about it you actually did other things to but that's getting an alignment with consciousness right consciousness when i'm doing the meditations 
the conscious, you're, you're doing it already. You're not realizing, see, you manifested Anthony Williams, you know, last time you said, why does he not publish uh, his uh, registration on a holiday? I was working on that day. Remember you said that? Yes. You immediately manifested, look at what you manifested. He, he <laughs> who advertises that you can do a registry? All his people were working yesterday on a holiday that means, because if any problems occurred with that registration, they would have had to be available on 4th of July, right? You are, right. You'll, you'll realize, right? When he opens up registration on 4th of July, that means all his people and him are working on 4th of July. Mm. Right? Nobody understands this. When we when we say, oh, oh the workshop is so-and-so, there's work behind it, right? We are yes, doing lot, work behind it lot, and we're yeah. making sure that things are happening, right? It's not like, okay, somebody tapped the button and it happened. So uh, what I'm saying is, is uh, when um, April is saying, feel the space, it's not so much as do a specific space and get attached to that space, right? What, she, what Dr. Joe says is like, feel what it is to be that. Like, okay, our, I love going to Egypt. So I, I visualize myself going to, looking at pictures of uh, uh, the pyramids, uh, looking at the pictures of spa spaces in Egypt, right? But I'm not attached. If I don't ever in my life go to Egypt, I'm not going to be dead. Like, I'm not going to be brokenhearted and this thing. But I do look at the pictures, right? But how is it going to happen? What year is it going to happen? I'm not going to think, oh, oh I'm going to take April. And those specifics, I, I don't get focused on the specifics, right? Now I got an idea. Summer is a great person. So some year, in a couple, three years, uh, last summer, summer is going to be fun to go to Egypt with. So I'll ask when once I have enough money. I'll, another <laughs> is, I put that idea in myself that I need to ask summer to go on vacation. But do you realize? Look at his uh, becoming supernatural and tuning into new potentials because you have to you have to focus on the elevated emotion. The thought sends the signal out. The emotion is what brings the manifestation in. So if you're not feeding the emotion, you're saying, oh, I, I, I don't have that relationship. I don't have the relationship. Where's the emotion? <laughs> Do I really look like that? <laughs> oh my God. Where's the emotion about this relationship <laughs> that I'm going to be so joyful? I'm going to love it. I'm going to love that this person is with me. I'm going to love that April is with me on this vacation. I'm going to pay for her vacation. I'm going to have this thing. I'm going to take her on my vacation. I'm going to go to Germany with April. Yeah, like I want Summer to, says I thanks want... for bringing me up so many times. We love you, Summer. We love you, Summer. And so, you're sharing with us all your pictures from different yeah, places you go. So, yeah, we know you like it. So you realize what emotion actually draws, what emotion you need to have? You, you need to say, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'm good, universe, I think I'm, I'm just gonna go on vacation to, uh, to Germany and I'm gonna take April, April with me and I, I, I just make it happen, right? Just make it happen. And just feel the joy of being in Germany, like look at Nada's pictures and feel yourself standing where Nada is standing in Germany, right? Nada has been posting, Yes, all that. you need to do so the elevated joy that you feel about being in germany is what is going to draw that experience to you uh, learn what is going to draw that experience to you i would love to take you all to poland actually in poland poland polish beaches are amazing there uh, the scent is so like a like flower it's okay. so beautiful deal and then... deal we'll go to poland with you <laughs> I, I need to make a trip to India, but after that, we go to Poland, okay? <laughs> On the way back. Uh, Sri Lakshmi offered, <laughs> next time you genuinely fall short of company, <laughs> think of Sri Lakshmi. <laughs> you have so many friends here. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Thanks, it's 9.30 for you. Have a good night. Much love. Many blessings. Thank you so much. Eternally grateful to everyone for being yeah. here. Thank, Thank you. you.
Bye, Sri Lakshmi. Bye, David. Bye. Bye, Bye Ram. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye, yeah. Patricia. <laughs>